In this first video of the series, we speak to Joe Edelman. Now, he's a photographer and he's been in the game for over 40 years. But recently, he's been using YouTube Live to engage with his audience. So let's jump on over and speak to Joe and find out how he's been using YouTube Live and what tips you can learn from him. So we're here with Joe Edel Edelman and uh, thank you very much for taking the call today and welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, James. It's a pleasure to be here. So if you'd just like to let the viewers know who you are and what it is you do. Well, my name is Joe Edelman and as it says on my business card, I shoot people with a camera, of course. I'm a photographer. I've been a photographer for 40 years, which makes me kind of old, but my channel is not your typical photography channel. I am really all about teaching people kind of the hows and whys, the behind the scenes, or if you will, the behind the behind the scenes of what goes into making consistently good photographs of people. Okay, and can you, can you also just let the viewers know a little bit about why you started to use YouTube? Initially, I started using it just to figure out what the hell it was all about. Uh, I started back in like 2009, which wasn't the very beginning, but it was pretty early on. That's when I did my first video. Uh, unfortunately, it is still on my channel today. It is really bad, horrible audio. I kind of look like I got to stick up my butt through the whole presentation, but it was pretty good content. And I was really honestly just interested in what's this all about. At the time, I was starting to teach photography workshops. So I thought, hey, this might be a good idea or a good way for people to get a sense of who I am and how I teach by putting some videos up. So I tried a couple and they weren't that great, but I got a good response. And over the years, I tried a couple more. Uh, to make a long story short, had a bad experience with a multi-channel network, took two years off, came back to it, still wasn't sure what I was gonna do with it. And then a year ago, I got crazy and decided, you know what, I'm gonna do this full time. I'm gonna become a full time YouTuber. I'm gonna give myself 12 months. I set up a business plan. If I can meet my goals, I get to keep going. The good news is, 12 months comes up in June of this year, and I'm way ahead of my goals, so I will still be doing it. Well, that, that's very good to hear. Um, so as the topic of this, this video uh, says, uh, we're gonna be specifically talking about YouTube Live and how you've been using it and how you found sort of audience interaction with YouTube Live. Okay. So for me, um, again, I wasn't one of the first photographers to use it, but I'm, very proud to say I am the first photographer that's doing three live shows a week, scheduled live shows. So I do a Monday night, a Wednesday night, and a Thursday night at 6.30 p.m. Eastern here in the U.S. Um, the show is called Tog Chat Live. Um, and the start of it really was a result of having the opportunity to spend a week with YouTube last August. I was selected for New York here in the U.S., as part of the Next Up class of 2016, which is a great experience. That was right about the time YouTube was putting on their big push for live. They'd had live for a while, but it was last summer that YouTube really started to ramp up the awareness and was really starting to push it. So needless to say, at the Next Up camp, we heard about live nonstop, even though they taught us nothing about it while we were there. It was not part of the curriculum. It was pushed a lot. So going back to my concept for my channel, the whole idea was I don't want to add to the noise. There's already a lot of really great photographers on YouTube. I wanted to be able to do something that was different and, and had value because it's a photography channel. It's really not entertainment. It's teaching. So mm -hmm. I started initially with Facebook Live. That was my first foray, and that was back just in November of last year just to test it out. I have a Facebook group. At the time, it only had about 3,000 members. It's up over 7,000 now. So I started doing a couple live feeds in there and they were, as you would expect if you've ever done live feeds, disastrous. I did them with a webcam. I was using the built-in microphones in, in my, my Macs. Um, then as I started to advance to bigger and better equipment, had all kinds of sound issues, video issues, you name it. But the good part is that was my testing ground. When I finally started with YouTube, it was in December. The first one was received really, really well but I was still kind of holding back a little bit on going really crazy with it. And so December, or January, I added a second show. In February, I added the third show. I'm gonna stay at the three for, for right now, but each of the three nights is kind of a very different format. Monday nights, I do photo reviews where it's essentially what most people will call a critique, but I don't like that word. 
Uh, Wednesday night, it's an open Q&A where literally it's just rapid fire. People um, giving me questions about photography topics, me answering them, which by the way, and I'll gladly tell you more about that when it comes up, is a great tool for super chat donations. And then Thursday night is a marketing one. So it's all about marketing for photographers where I review a photographer's website and talk about uh, different marketing opportunities and techniques. Okay, well that's very good. Um, so I'd like to just find find a little bit about how has your audience changed or reacted to you using YouTube Live as opposed to you know pre-recorded videos like normal? Right. Um, well, they love it. I mean, I, I haven't gone one hundred percent to YouTube Live. My uh, recorded video production slowed down a little bit in the first couple months of the year because I was really committed to kind of getting all the kinks out with the live stream stuff. So that was eating up a lot of time. I wasn't getting as many tutorials out, but I, was, I still average one tutorial a week at a minimum. My goal is always two tutorials and three live shows each week. That's my goal. So um, on the plus side, what YouTube Live has done is it's really allowed me to kind of solidify a base of very religious followers. So these are followers that show up for every show or they'll always be in the Monday night or always be on the Thursday night, but they show up every time. These are the folks that also go out and talk about it. These are the folks that when I start the show, I can say, hey, listen, I need everybody to do me a favor. Take a second and go out and tweet, post on your Facebook you know, page that you're here at Talk Chat, you're watching it live. I give them the link to put up. I have a... Um, I use a service called Rebrandly, so I have a shortened URL, which is tog.chat slash live. So I give them that so that they, they send it out over social media. So they kind of help me spread the word, get the marketing out, which helps me grow the attendance numbers each week. Um, it really builds more of a sense of community. The Facebook group is great. The challenge with the Facebook group is there's almost no way to monetize it. And I found out the hard way in talking to a lot of camera manufacturers and equipment manufacturers, and I've heard the same thing from other um, creators in other industries, advertisers are gun shy about the Facebook groups because it's a lot of extra work for them to be able to access them. They have much less control. It's a little bit more the wild, wild west. So it's really, really hard for them to be able to say, hey, I'm gonna go sponsor this group and then be able to really see what their ROI is on their investment. So, I knew that the Facebook group for me really would be something that's just going to feed YouTube. But um, what I wound up doing, I was doing five live streams a week. I was doing the three YouTube ones, two uh, other nights I was doing Facebook. And I simply ran a survey in my Facebook group and said, hey, if I stopped doing Facebook, would you guys like still watch me or will you only watch me live on Facebook? And it was literally like 98% said, sure, we'll, we'll go to either platform. In fact, a lot of people actually preferred the YouTube platform because of the running chat stream, which hmm. Facebook's isn't quite as smooth. It doesn't always update as quick. So um, really it's, it's for community and it solidifies the community. For me, that's, that's the biggest thing. Okay, so do you find that uh, more people will watch the video live or do you find that more people sort of watch it afterwards? Uh, definitely more watch it afterwards. I mean, the challenge I have, uh, I have a worldwide audience. If I go through my analytics, I've got people viewing my videos from over 114 countries the last time I looked, which is great. The challenge of that is I'm doing it at 6.30 p.m. here in the East Coast of the U.S., which means it's like the middle of the night in Europe. It's the next morning in like Australia and Asia. So. Um, you know, I get a decent sized audience when I do it live, but the bulk of the views come afterwards. I have people that will routinely, um, you know, come back and watch the show at a time that's convenient for them. And I have some that kind of make it a habit that they've reached out to me and told me it's one of their weekend rituals is they'll spend like a Sunday morning or a, a Saturday morning and they'll catch up on, on my three talk chats from the week. <laughs> well, that, well that, that's good. It's good, good to see that, you know, you're still getting a lot of interaction after you've done the live stream. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so as you mentioned earlier, the super chat feature, that's something that's only recently come in and it's not available to all YouTubers yet. It, it's, it's slowly being rolled out. And I know that you're one of the, the YouTubers that have got access to this. So how have you found it, you know, from a creator's standpoint? It's awesome. I mean, um, it, it's like any other new product. 
uh, it's flawed, but it's awesome. So certainly if you're going to take a completely passive approach to it, it's not going to do a damn thing for you. Uh, because at first, when you first roll it out, don't assume that people know what it is. So you've got to go through the process of educating your, your viewers that, hey, there's this super chat thing. So I mentioned earlier that Wednesday nights are the, are the night for me where I really do well in super chat. I, I've made as much as $500 doing a one hour live stream via super chat on a Wednesday night. So since that's a Q and A session for me, what happens is I have somebody that's monitoring the chat feed for me and pulling all the questions out so that I can keep paying attention to the camera. And in fact, they're not even at my location when we're doing it. They're sharing the questions back to me via Google Doc and they're, they're edited and formatted in a way that's easy for me to read. Mm -hmm. So that way I can keep going. But people quickly realize there's so many questions. If they've got a question they really want me to answer, they realize they're not going to get it answered. So I explained several times during the show, I have little screens that will drop in that say, hey, if you've got a question that you really need an answer to and you want to be sure that I'll answer it, you can make a donation through Super Chat, anywhere from a dollar to five hundred dollars, because that's what Super Chat allows for. And I guarantee you, even if I have to stay longer than the hour, I will answer all Super Chat questions. Um, so I don't hold people hostage over it. I answer, I certainly answer more questions for free than I do on Super Chat. But the point is, there are people that will come in with actually very specific, oftentimes kind of very user-specific questions. In other words, they're not necessarily questions that really appeal to everyone that's there. But I take the time to answer them. I give very detailed answers, and people are more than willing to kind of say thank you. On the downsides to Super Chat, the current system, and, and I say this with my fingers crossed, optimistically, I think that YouTube will receive pressure down the road once everybody has it, and once users universally become comfortable with it. I think well, YouTube's gonna get a little bit more pressure to reduce the cut that they're taking. Currently, YouTube takes 30% of whatever you get in a Super Chat. So their tool, they built it. Mm. I praise Google and YouTube, but that's a pretty big chunk. So, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a balance thing as far as that goes. Right now, there's no leverage to do anything about that. I think that once it's rolled out universally, there may potentially be a little bit more pushback. Because we all know that inevitably there are going to be other companies that are going to figure out ways to tie into Google's API or do something that you can launch kind of simultaneously to your video, you know, to do the same thing. So um, yeah. I think that will ultimately create a little bit of pressure to get Google to, you know, maybe not take a full 30, maybe at least roll it back to 20. But I have no factual information to base that on. That's just my hope and my gut feeling. Oh, well, well let's, let's hope that happens because that, that does sound like a fair chunk. I know that a lot of my viewers are going to want to know what sort of equipment do you use for your live streaming? You know, specifically, you know, the hardware and, you know, the actual streaming software that you use. Sure. Well, I have uh, literally kind of turned my office into a studio here and I'm actually getting ready to set up a similar setup in my actual photo studio. So I'll, I'll have I'll have a broadcast set up in two locations. But... I work on um, a 27-inch iMac computer that is maxed out for RAM. It's a 32-gig machine. Uh, it's a i7 core machine, so it's the, pretty much the fastest it's currently available. From a camera standpoint, I am using a Panasonic GH4. I run the HDMI feed out of the Panasonic. So that's a 4K feed that's coming out. I run it through a Blackmagic Ultra Studio mini recorder, which is basically a tiny little box that is a converter. Uh, that allows me to connect to the iMac via Thunderbolt port. Uh, they're also available for USB 3.0. Um, I use a Thunderbolt version. So that gives me my video image. For audio, um, I actually just switched up until very recently. I was using a Rode Podcaster. That was the mic of choice. Um, I've been wanting to be able to go wireless because sometimes I'll find myself wanting to like stand up and demonstrate something with a pose or something like that. Mm -hmm. So now what I'm using is um, Sennheiser uh, wireless lavaliers on the Sennheiser, uh, the EN100 packs. I use uh, a little converter that's called an Onyx Black Magic converter which has uh, two ports um, for microphones or one for a microphone, one for an instrument that um, then runs into the computer via USB port. 
So that gives me my audio. Um, and then from a software standpoint, I use Wirecast. Um, I'm using the pro version, which unfortunately is the expensive one, which is just about a thousand dollars. Um, but there is a slightly less expensive version. That's about $500. Um, so depending on what features you want and what capabilities you want, uh, those are two options. There's also, uh, a, actually a very good piece of software that is free. Uh, it's open source. It's called OBS. Um, and, um, really the big difference between the two in terms of quality, there's no difference. They're both capable of doing exactly the same thing. Um, the real difference is, um, in terms of kind of producing your show and giving it more of a polished feel, Wirecast is much better suited to be able to do live switching and really do lots of screen configurations. And I, I run it myself. So literally I kind of equate it to the way DJs used to run a soundboard. When they were doing their show, they would run a board where they're, you know, they're bringing all their sound effects in and, and all that kind of stuff. And that's essentially what I'm doing. I've got two screens on either side of me here. So you're looking at me through a regular webcam now because unfortunately my Panasonic won't feed into Google. But um, I have two 27 inch screens on either side. So the screen that is the computer is on this side. Uh, an additional 27 inch cinema screen is on this side. So that way I can have software on one side. I have whatever it is I'm displaying to people, whether it be Lightroom or whether it be a web browser, that's on the other side. And then I have separate windows opened up to control the live feed, to review the chat screen. And then also for the person that I have monitoring my comments offsite, uh, I have a Google Doc is all we simply use to be able to communicate back and forth so that they can send me messages, give me updates and questions. So. Oh, well, that's, that's very good. I'm, uh, I'm sure uh, I'll leave in the description a, a full rundown of uh, a list of all that, that equipment. Um, so for, a, for someone starting out on YouTube Live, what would be your sort of, you know, top tips to give them when they're, you know, just sort of first starting out with YouTube Live? Um, I, I think that the first most important tip that I would give anybody, I'm going to steal an advertising line from a sneaker company. Just do it. Just do it and go ahead and suck at it because everybody does when they first start. <laughs> um, it's, it's a lot of new technology. Certainly, you know, I'm a still photographer for my entire life. When YouTube became a serious thing for me, I had a big learning curve with, with video. I had an even bigger learning curve with audio. Audio was my Achilles heel for a long time and still is. Um, and then along came this live stuff and suddenly I realized that I had no clue how to get an image to come out of a real camera into a computer, go out on the internet. So there's all this learning curve. And then when you start doing it, you suddenly realize every little flub, blunder, everything you do, people are watching. So the reason I encourage people just do it, there's a learning curve. You're going to screw things up. You will get better at presenting. You will get better with the technology. But you're not going to do any of that if you just keep planning and planning and planning or buying equipment and buying equipment and buying equipment. You, you got to get out there and do it. And the best part of YouTube is if you're building a successful YouTube channel, you're connecting with people. I don't care if you're doing kids toys or if you're doing YouTube guidance or if you're doing photography. I don't care what the topic is. If it's beauty, if you're being successful in any way, you're connecting with people. So these are people that appreciate the content that you're offering. As long as you're trying, people recognize that and people reward you for that because they see that you're trying. They are very tolerant. Believe me, when I started live streaming, you know, at the end of last year, uh, the very first three live streams that I did on YouTube, and they're still there on YouTube, they were disastrous. Um, I was having problems that I'd be 10 minutes into the show and uh, for some reason all my audio would just go completely staticky. And I figured out by luck, the very first time it happened, if I unplugged the mic and plugged it back in again, it would resolve itself. And then 15 minutes later, it would happen again. So it happened like three times during the show. Uh, the very first live stream that I did, I was using webcams. But then I decided, no, no, no. I went out and I bought this Blackmagic Ultra Mini Recorder. And I was using at the time a Nikon DA10 because those are the cameras that I use for my stills. So I was all excited. I set it up. The image was awesome because it was a full 1080p image coming out of the camera. I went live, 12 minutes later, the camera shut off. I didn't realize 
that the camera would only run on video for 12 minutes before the battery made it turn off. So I was like, so I had to keep restarting the camera to get through the whole live feed. So you talk about embarrassing and stupid, but people actually commented at the end that they thought it was great. One, that I kept going, but two, the content was good. They tuned in for the content. So I think that's that number one, that's the biggest thing people have to do is I hear so many people talk, yeah, I want to try it, but I don't understand this. I don't understand. It. Just do it. You can do it on your phone now. So there's really no excuse not to try. The second thing is don't lose sight of why you're on YouTube in the first place. Understand that's why people are watching you. So if you're going live just for the sake of going live, you're probably not going to get people interested. And in my opinion, you'll potentially do damage to your user base. Oh. You've got to take what you've been doing, whether you're doing it like just standing in front of the camera and talking or scripting. My, my tutorials, my recorded videos, they're scripted. I use a teleprompter, the whole bit. But um, it doesn't matter which way you do your regular videos. You've got to find a way to take that content, that subject matter, and turn it into something that you can present in real time. And most importantly, from the heart. Because almost any topic on YouTube, unless it's you know like prank videos and that kind of stuff, if you're instructing people, whether you're a YouTube instructor, whether you're a beauty instructor, photography, if you're passionate about what you're doing, that's the part that people are actually connecting with. So you've got to make sure that you're not just doing live for the sake of doing live. There, there's got to be something that people are familiar with with you that you're bringing forward, but doing it in real time. And what people like about that is they, they realize they're getting to see the real you, warts and all. And, and people appreciate that. Um, from there, not to contradict my first statement, so I mean this as a long-term tip. Understand that quality creates a perception. So once you get the ball rolling, and once you figure out, number one, I can do this, number two, I can commit the time, and three, and probably most importantly, my audience actually enjoys it, then you need to turn your focus a little bit more. You need to keep doing what you're doing, but you need to turn your focus to upping your game and not using a webcam like I'm using right now, but using a higher quality camera, getting better audio, making sure that your lighting is you know, attractive and functional in the setting that you're doing it in. Um, those little things mean a lot when they're on top of really good content, oh. but they cost money. So I don't encourage anybody to go out and like get all the stuff together and say, okay, now I'm going to do my first live feed because it's just overkill. So you want to get all the mistakes out of the way. You want to test your theories, test your content, test your concept. And then if it works, now it makes sense from a business standpoint. Let's start investing some money. And even if it takes time, but let's start investing money and, and, and upgrade the technology. And that's essentially what I did. Now I did it in a fairly short window. But I'm also doing three of these a week, and and I was actually going live five times a week because two of the nights were in Facebook. So, so, is there anything else that you'd like to just uh, add to the end of this video at all? Gosh, um, you know, I, if I was going to give anybody any advice, it, it's a piece of advice that I give at the end of all my videos. So obviously, this is geared towards photographers, but. We can change a couple words and it applies to every YouTuber that's out there, whether they're big, whether they're small, whether they're just getting started or whether they've been doing it for years. So my, my sign off when I finish my videos and my live shows is I tell people now go pick up that camera and shoot something because your best shot, it's your next shot. So keep learning, keep thinking and keep shooting. And you can apply that to this YouTube thing. I mean, a lot of people, I have college students. I teach a college course here locally, and I have college students. Three of the kids that are in my class, it's a class about creativity. They are dying to be YouTubers. So I'm like their idol because I'm on YouTube and I'm doing it. And they're all afraid that they're not good enough. So what happens is they don't produce content because they're afraid people won't think it's good. And I try to make them understand, listen, the net result of what you're doing the net result is you're being lazy, which of course they don't like that. They're offended by that because they are working at it, but because they don't actually produce anything, they're lazy. There's nothing there. So you always have to understand that if you're, if you're coming from the right place, if you're doing it because you have a passion for what you're doing and what you want to share, 
And if you're being honest and sincere with people, don't worry about the screw ups. Don't worry about the flubs because each time you're going to get a little better. Hence your best shot. It's your next shot, your best video. It's going to be your next video. And don't ever let yourself, you know, I'm not, I'm not a kid on YouTube, but my working philosophy in life is to never stop learning because the day that I do, I'm as good as being a dinosaur. And we all know how that turned out. So I don't want to be a dinosaur. So I enjoy the learning curve. I enjoy the new technology. I enjoy the challenge of that. And, and I think in this environment, you know, if you look historically at changes in the world and changes in technology, we're at a point already where we take the internet for granted. We're at a point where we take YouTube for granted. But historically, if you look at where we are in the development of the internet and YouTube, this is still the equivalent of the wild, wild west. And that's actually a lot of fun. So, you know, you can't let yourself get boxed in by all these rules and you can't feel, you, oh, you've got to do something that's going to go viral every time. It's not about being viral. If it starts with a passion, you just got to keep doing it. So that's my advice. Okay, well, again, thank you very much, Joe, for being on the show. And to all of my uh, watchers and subscribers that are watching right now, I will have links down in the description to Joe's YouTube page and also to his Facebook page and his Facebook group if you do happen to be a photographer and would like to join. Although I would advise reading the post at the top when you do get into the group. Because that's right. very important. Um, and again, thank you very much, Joe, for being on the show. Awesome, James. It was great to be here. Thanks for having me. Good luck.